Thank you all so much for attending our fall 2020 second annual uh, student showcase here at PVCC in the Industrial Electronics Technology Department. We are super thrilled that we survived this semester and have uh, just some things to show you as a result of a lot of hard work. Before we get started, I do want to give a shout out to John Kingsley uh, and Jim Shifley for setting us up. So thank you guys so much for getting us into this webinar and, and making it happen and working with our, our program. Um, I will introduce uh, the professors in the program. Uh, myself, Eric Bretter, I am the faculty member in, this, uh, in the Industrial Electronics Technology Program. Ken Wellborn is a uh, dual, dual purpose PVCC employee um, and is working on a bunch of special projects within the college. And he's also teaching three classes with us. So he's kept quite busy um, and, and he'll share some of his stuff. Hunter Long is a new addition uh, to our program this semester and what a semester to jump into. Um, he also had a baby this semester and uh, took on a full class as an adjunct. So thank you guys so much. Um, we have had a hybrid format for most of our classes to make sure that uh, students can still come in and work on their projects. We've been following the COVID protocol um, and it has provided some interesting uh, scenarios for, for learning for sure, as many of you are probably all aware. Um, students in some classes would come in once a week and rotate through shorter lab classes where they would get their lectures delivered online. Um, and some other classes were heavier project-based classes where you need to spend more time in the lab. So we would spend three hours in the lab one week and you'd wait a week or two to come back in and spend a few more hours. So uh, it's, it's been quite a journey to get through this. And some of the projects you'll see have really, um, really show the dedication of the students. So a big round of applause to all of the students who have just contributed so much. It's a hard time to learn right now and education is probably just shifting greatly. Um, so thank you all for persevering and sticking with it and continuing to learn, grow, put yourself in a position for a new, a new life and um, just very proud of a lot of you and thank you so much for being positive this whole semester. Um, our program, if you are new or haven't really seen too much or are just checking in, is a hands-on skill-based technical education program here at Piedmont. We're hoping to meet the needs of the advanced manufacturing industry and provide students with real-time skills that um, are actually applicable. So giving students the opportunities to work on um, computer-aided design, computer advanced manufacturing, and uh, computer automated manufacturing and um, using the actual CNC machines, hand tools, um, and, and then the flip side of that is the electronics, being able to program, uh, troubleshoot, use a multimeter, uh, the whole kit and caboodle. So you'll see some of these projects that display a lot of the skills um, and the mindset that we're trying to get after here. So uh, thank you all so much uh, for those of you who have joined from industry, from our community, from our college. Um, we really appreciate you spending uh, an hour and a half with us. I do want to introduce uh, Katie Thatch. She's our program liaison, um, and she has worked tirelessly uh, with a lot of these students to make sure that they're registered for their classes, they're taking the right things for the right stuff, meeting their school work needs schedules, and um, I just want to let her share a little bit about her semester as well. Thanks, Eric. Um... Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I've been impressed and so proud of students this semester and grateful to the faculty who they've all gone above and beyond and our community. We get, we've gotten so much support um, in a virtual realm and I'm just really grateful and excited for tonight that we get to continue that. So if there's new, perhaps there's some new folks watching or community members, if, if these are things you're interested in and you have any questions, I bet Eric will share more of how to do that, but there's a question and answer at the bottom. And I just can uh, encourage you to chime in. <laughs> we're, we're here, we'd be happy to answer things or give more info and um, just reach out and connect with us and we could help you if this is something you're interested in. Thanks, Eric. Awesome, thank you, Katie. 
Um, yeah, Katie, Katie mentioned there's a Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Uh, you feel free to click that. It'll pop open a window and you can ask questions in there and we'll try to answer questions live as the videos are playing. Um, what it will do is introduce the professor for each of those classes. They'll talk a little bit about the class. We'll share a couple of videos um, and, then, uh, and then we'll keep moving along in that, in that fashion. So feel free to jump in there at any times. Um, and if you guys just want to chat to everybody in the group, you can feel free to use the chat bar as well. I'll try to look at that uh, while this thing's going on. All right, uh, without further ado, we're going to start with uh, our introductory courses and then move on to some of the higher level courses as we continue. Um, I was lucky enough to teach a uh, computer-aided drawing class this semester. It's one of the first classes and it's one of our most popular classes here at PVCC. Um, and we had a good time. A lot of the instruction was done online and students were still able to make some of their projects on the 3D printer to make them come alive. Um, and you'll see some students even came in to produce their, their products. And we learned uh, as a mindset parametric design so that students could manipulate their designs and change uh, different um, aspects of them through equations uh, so that their designs are fully manipulatable and, and iterative in nature. Um, we used SOLIDWORKS uh, this semester and uh, a bunch of students are working towards their SOLIDWORKS certification as a result. So uh, this will be our first one. So hopefully I can properly share my screen with all of the Zoom practice I've had over the last few months. Let's see. Uh, I'm guessing I forgot to hit the share audio, so we'll do that one more time. Great job, Eric. All right. Hello, my name is Kobe. I am a student at PVCC. Uh, Eric Bretter is my professor in CAD 151. And I'm here to show you my drawing and my final assignment. Um, basically, in SolidWorks, I made a drawer, which is a replica of my dad's old dresser drawer, which I'm very fond of. And I hope to replicate one day as it's made of particle board and it has a veneer on it and I'd rather have it solid wood. Um, so yeah, here we go. This is my one piece of the puzzle. This is the front part of the drawer. Um, I made a slot in the top that you'll see later is going to receive a drawer pull that's quite unique. Um, right here, we can see there are little holes to receive some dowels uh, for construction. And the bottom here is a slot to receive a bottom part of the drawer, which is probably just gonna be made out of any kind of typical quarter inch material. Um, didn't really have a lot of challenge with this particular piece um, in mating this one to the rest of the drawer. Lining these dowel holes with it was a little bit of a challenge, um, but that's about it. Um, I'm going to show you my drawer pull next, which is right here, um, and here it is. This one was odd because I kind of designed it um, on the fly. So I'm going to show you my drawing, the original drawing right here. Maybe I can hide some of these annotations. Here we are. Show featured dimensions. Well, anyways, here is this ridiculous drawing. So this is a profile view. Um, this is the part that you would actually use to pull it out. And this little uh, tab here is gonna notch into the slot. I chose maple as the material because I'm somewhat familiar with it. Um, and yeah, this is one of the things I'd like to see in reality built because I'm not sure if the distance from this um, arc to the front of the drawer is gonna be enough for fingers to get in there and really pull it. So that's one thing I'd like to see, you know, when theory meets practice. Um, now I'm going to show you my third part, um, which I call the main body. This one was a little bit more extensive and probably the most complicated. 
um, still maple construction. And here are the holes that I'm mentioning where this part will match the front part of the drawer. You can see this slot here. And this is one of the things I had an issue with because in my design tree, which you can see right here, I had um, made these side pieces first. Um, I, at least I thought I had. And then um, I made this slot. So I had an issue where, let's see, it is, I believe this spot here. So I had moved this um, in my design tree in the wrong place. So when I did this extrude cut, it didn't cut this slot here because um, I had used the mirror function and it was basically taking priority. So that was the one things I had to troubleshoot. I was like, why is this slot not cutting through one side? It's because it wasn't in the proper place in my design tree. Um, and now let's see it all put together. Aha, here we are. So in this assembly, I did use dowels. I'm gonna show you something like this, aha. So now you can see how these holes match up to each other where the uh, main body of the drawer meets the front body. You can also see how I made it and married the front drawer with the drawer pull. Um, so it's just a really simple design, but you know, it makes me really happy. Um, I have this slot here. It's going to receive um, the runner for the actual dresser itself. Um, and that's about it. Um, if I were to change something in my design, uh, I don't know as of yet. I kind of want to build it in reality to see. Um, but right now I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens when I make it a real thing. Uh, thank you and pleasant learning and happy holidays. Hello. My name is Nick Jones, and I'm a student in the CAD 151 Engineering Drawing Fundamentals class at PVCC. My final project consisted of designing and fabricating a prototype hot wax extruder. I conceived of this project as an investigation into fitting an inexpensive FDM 3D printer, such as the Ender 3, with a hot wax extruder to enable 3D printing of wax models for use in investment casting processes. CAD 151 equipped me with the functional knowledge of the many powerful design tools within SOLIDWORKS and made it possible for me to build a prototype hot wax extruder quickly and precisely. My design started with an idea and a sketch. It was informed by my interests in 3D printing and investment casting, and many of my design choices are inspired by the remarkable contraptions that others have designed. I decided to use a progressive cavity pump to pump wax from the reservoir. This is an animation of a progressive cavity pump in action. Above the pump in blue are representations of the cavities formed and advanced by the action of the rotor within the stator. If you guess that it's a difficult thing for a new engineering student to draw, you'd be right. Fortunately, I was able to find an example of a progressive cavity pump to adapt to my own design. Here it is. Fun fact, the original pump was designed to extrude pancake batter onto a hot skillet, very precisely. Not sure if I... Using the skills I learned in class, I was able to dissect the SOLIDWORKS design tree generated by the original I author. I edited the forms to produce 3D printable parts and assemble a first mock-up. My next step was to mold the pump stator and the flexible RTV rubber. Based on the general dimensions of the first mock-up, I sketched the mold body and then created a mold assembly in SOLIDWORKS based on that sketch. The parts were modeled in SOLIDWORKS, saved as STL files, and then prepared for 3D printing in Prusa Slicer. On the left is the partially assembled stator mold prior to injection. On the right is the open mold after the RTV rubber injection cured overnight. 
Next, I tackled marrying the stator, rotor, and stepper motor. I deviated from my original idea to mount the pump and stepper motor directly onto the wax reservoir. Instead, I incorporated those mounts into a sheet metal chassis that can be submerged in any reservoir of proper depth. This approach requires additional fabrication initially, but I think it will eventually speed the process of iterating the different design features of pump and reservoir. Here's a sketch of the chassis on the left and the model created using the sheet metal tools in SOLIDWORKS on the right. The sheet metal chassis and stator mounting bracket models were flattened, and using the HSM Works CAM environment in SOLIDWORKS, 2D toolpaths for CNC milling were generated. I then bent the sheet metal chassis, uh, chassis to form and, and assemble all of the pump and motor components. Here are a few fabrication highlights. I made a motion study in SOLIDWORKS to approximate the movement of the assembly. In the motion study, the rotor's range of motion ignores its actual eccentric path, but the demonstration was still useful, I think. One visual clue it gave me prior to final assembly was that the lower end of the drive shaft would require some sort of support. You'll see an added brace in the final assembly that addresses the issue. And here is the final, completely initial prototype. My next step is to replace the Arduino-driven stepper motor with the 3D printer's extruder stepper motor and see how the pump functions. Um, I'm very excited to con continue to use my new engineering skills to iterate and perfect my invention. Thanks for your time. For my project, I decided to create a shoji lampshade. As you can see, the final product is simple in its appearance, though the product consists of only two parts. The side portions are actually used a total of four times. When designing this product, I wanted to create something that could be built in the real world. One of the interesting aspects of, the, of this lampshade is that there aren't any screws or bolts that are actually required to keep the product together. This was solved by creating these uh, these eight pegs on the bottom of the top part and when mated together with the holes on the top of the side parts, notably here, here, it produces this eye, uh, the final project here which is the Shoji lampshade. The other aspect that I found to be pretty interesting about this lampshade is actually by um, by linking both the top and side parts to an external uh, notepad <clears throat> and linking their equations together. I actually made it possible to ch only change two, uh, two equations and the entire assembly would reflect those changes. So by changing the, the number of vertical panels and the number number of horizontal panels to a total of three and saving the document and then rebuilding you can see that that is now reflective by the three by three grids on both the top and the side in fact I actually made it possible to go up to a total of a four by four grid though I personally believe that that is a little much and I think that it's best if you just keep it between a 2x2 two two and a 3x3 three three grid. And so while in this particular model I've decided to use teak wood for the material, I think it would be far easier just to use regular plastic if this were to be 3D printed, as that would allow the product to actually function to its full potential by, uh, by actually using 
the, uh, the pegs that are there, followed by gluing the side pieces together for further, uh, to further study the product. Um, actually, the, the, uh, the, nest, the nested if statements were by far the most challenging aspect of this project, simply just because of the tedious nature of the nested if statements. Um, but overall, I feel like this project really did a good job of, of uh, using all the skills that were taught in this class, such as basic sketch geometry, followed by extrusions and cuts, uh, as well as feature pattern rep uh, repetitions. And while uh, nested if statements weren't exactly a uh, required part of the course, they were definitely a, a very uh, appreciated topic to have been covered, especially for this part. I think if I were to change anything, I th like I said, I think I would go back and use a different material. But as a whole, I'm very happy with how this project turned out. I was looking at the job website Indeed to see which local employers were looking for prospective employees with computer-aided design skills. I came across an interesting opportunity offered by Aerojet Rocketdyne. They were looking for an intern to help the engineering staff create 3D models of rocket nozzles. I thought of designing a rocket nozzle for my final project but there's a lot of math and physics involved and it wouldn't fulfill the requirement of being something useful to me. Instead, I was inspired by a three video series on rocket hacking to reverse engineer a store-bought rocket. In the videos, the engineer used SolidWorks to model a model rocket, 3D print it, and then launch it. I went to Hobby Lobby and bought two different kinds of rockets and settled on this one, the Viking. I found a very helpful tutorial on rocket building from Kuda Country Tech Ed. I measured the parts and then began modeling in SolidWorks. For the body, I used the offset entities tool to extrude a tube from the circle I had sketched. I used a different method to hollow out the nose cone. After constructing a solid cone with the style spline and revolve boss base tools, I utilized the shell command to hollow it out. For the fins, I implemented the full round fillet on the leading edge to make them more aerodynamic. After attaching one fin to the body tube, I use the circular pattern command to create the other three fins. In that the fins didn't have any right angles, I had created a reference plane from which to cut a slight rounding of the fin surface where it meets the body so that the contact would be flush. I was proud of myself for doing this, but then panicked and deleted it from the history tree when I encountered problems mating the fin and body, thinking this may have been the culprit. Improvements I would like to make to this design are to add internal structures that would support such things as the parachute attachment. What I learned from this project was how everything we learned fits together with this rocket incorporating elements of Eric's lessons involving such disparate things as pulleys and hair dryers. Hello, this is Isaac in my, and this is my presentation for my CAD 151 final project. For my final project, I decided to create a clock. Uh, my presentation was a cool video that I saw on YouTube. Uh, it was a one to Google gear ratio, and I wanted to make something like that, but a bit more useful. I'm going to pause there. Um, Isaac's video is going to combine the, the next set of videos with, with mine and, and Ken's. Uh, before we jump right in, 
Um, there were so many projects to choose from, from the classes. So you're just getting a little snippet of uh, the whole. Um, and what we're gonna try to do at the end of this is post a bunch of them together uh, into, into a repository. So if you actually wanna go back and watch the videos um, in entirety, or there was some ones that you thought was interesting, we'll try to post all those together um, and we'll link those to our, our website. Um, I do wanna say the, the next class that was gonna be up was um, Dr. Scott Cordellis, and he unfortunately wasn't able to attend tonight, but I do wanna give a shout out. He was instrumental in making this uh, semester happen. Uh, and he taught ACDC uh, this semester with students um, and, and had the labs revolving every week, um, which was really, really fantastic. So we'll miss him today, but we'll, we'll move on to um, Ken. If you want to introduce your, um, your first show class. Video for some reason. What's that? It says the host has stopped my video. Hmm. Okay, I can go forward without video. Not a big deal. So the next final projects we're going to look at are from the mechanisms class. That's our MEC 155 class. And mechanisms is a really great introductory class that we offer. And we study gears, linkages, cams. Uh, we, we focus on things like rotational motion to linear motion, which is very common in machinery. We go into concepts like mechanical advantage, you know, something like taking a, a force and multiplying it through a, a mechanism. We calculate forces and torques. We touch on a concept called finite element analysis, where it's a, a computer design tool where we study the, the strength of solid bodies so we can determine where they might fail first. Um, we take all these mechanisms and then we, we study them and then we drop them into CAD and we actually design mechanisms and ultimately build them so that we understand how the mechanism works. And, you know, in our program, it's really critical that we use our hands and build things to understand what we're doing. So we use things like laser cutters to cut plywood. We um, use 3D printers sometimes to, to make parts. So all of this kind of comes together to, to study a really cool concept. And, and bring it together. And like I said, it's one of our introductory classes that, that leads on to bigger and better projects. So it's one of our fundamentals. Awesome. Useful. So I turn it into, the, into a clock. Um, I wanted it to count for multiple classes. Uh, and so I completely designed the clock, not just a little bit of it, and cut it out on the laser cutter. My first step in the design process was to calculate the gear ratio that I needed to create the actual clock. I decided that I wanted to start with a constant 60 RPM input from a motor, which would turn the gear every second. So then I just had to calculate from one second to 60 seconds, and then from 60 seconds to 60 minutes, and then from 60 minutes to 24 hours. The next step after that was uh, using SolidWorks to design those gears and how to put them all together. Uh, which wasn't as hard because of the SOLIDWORKS toolbox, but was still not an easy feat. The final step was to laser cut and glue the gears, laser cut the gears and to glue them together so that they turn together and so that it creates a working prototype. Um, what did I learn? Well, uh, I definitely learned more about, I just kind of practiced my skills, learned more about the ins and outs of SOLIDWORKS. Um, I definitely I, I learned from the ground up how to uh, do a motion study and apply physics to the parts so that they all turn together. And I learned the difference between the basic motion study and a motion analysis study, kind of. I, I realized that emotion motion analysis was what I needed to use, but as I, you see in this one, I, I never completely figured out what the difference was. I just figured out that the motion study Motion analysis was the one that best, best suited what I needed. Um, I definitely had trouble with properly constraining each part because in some of the motion studies, the gears would just start flying off in random directions because I didn't actually constrain them properly, which while it was quite funny, didn't exactly accomplish what I was trying to go for. Uh, and then I also had trouble with the toolbox gears overriding the custom gears that I had made. Uh, I had made a couple of custom gears so that I could tell how far along they were, but every time I reloaded the 
Sol- every time I reload SolidWorks, they would get overwritten by just the generic parts. Uh, improvements that I can make next time. Uh, I when I, I when I started, I just wanted to get this done, so I just did the gear ratios as is. I didn't try and add any intermediate ones to make it look nice or anything, and so it ended up being that one of the telling time gears um, goes the wrong direction. So it means that it goes counterclockwise instead of clockwise, like a clock. Uh, and the next, I would also improve the way I attached it, the gears to the backboard, because right now they fail, I mean, they fall off if they are rotated too fast, too much, um, or the backboard gets bumped or anything. And ultimately, I would like to redesign it so that it runs smoother and looks a little bit better, because wood on one doesn't exactly run smooth, and right now it just looks like a bunch of gears attached to a backboard. I also wanted to show my final project in CAD. This is the gears turning. This is the motor. This is the driven gear. Uh, one second per turn. This is the uh, one minute gear. So every one minute it does a full rotation. This is the one hour gear. So every one hour it does a full rotation. This is the 24 hour gear. So every 24 hours it does a full rotation. So it takes so I haven't technically actually gotten to try this one because it takes so long for it to get all the way to there. Yep, and maybe I'll add a video of my completed version. Here's the final project. And if I turn this gear, as you can see, it does turn. This one turns eventually. It's just really a long time with such a high gear ratio. All right. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm here to present my final project for MEC 155. Uh, for this class, uh, for my final project, I have built a orrery, which is a mechanical model of the solar system. It demonstrates the relative movement of the planets. And uh, it uses a series of gear chains that uh, has specific ratios that are equivalent uh, to the time periods of the planet's orbits. Uh, it's a helpful visual aid to uh, to really, you can use it like a calendar to, to see how the planets were aligned on a specific date, or you could uh, predict, predict the movement of uh, the future movement of the planets. When I decided to build the, uh, the orrery, I uh, started researching it and I came across this uh, beautiful device built by uh, someone known as Zemon, and uh, <laughs> they posted the uh, they recorded the entire process on and posted YouTube videos of machining out the whole part, all, all the parts for all of it. And there's there's a ton of videos of, of this guy building this thing. Uh, it's 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 pretty cool process to watch and a re really nifty design. Um, <clears throat> he also posted his uh, his CAD, and uh, he even posted what his gear ratios were uh, to do the whole thing. When I looked into, um, you know, designing my own, I really, uh, I found that uh, the gear ratios that he came up with are, are really close to the movements of the actual planets. And considering that there's only four gears per level and none of the gears are extraordinarily large, um, it's really, as far as I was able to find the best way to go about it. So this is, these are the uh, ratios that I'm using in my design. Um, so, um, at this point, you know, I just uh, started modeling them in uh, in SolidWorks, and uh, you know, the design uh, kind of just came together. Uh, you know, it, it started to make sense how to build it as I modeled it, um, and I, uh, so <clears throat> I um, was a little concerned about uh, you know using. I knew I was going to have to use plywood or acrylic uh, laser cut years. Uh, wasn't going to have time to really do anything else. I was a little worried about plywood. We'd used plywood earlier in the semester and hadn't had the greatest success with some of those things. Um, it's, uh, but, it, and you know, um, all in all, I decided to, to go through with it with plywood. And uh, so I got some uh, hardware that uh, to help maybe reduce the friction of the whole thing and keep everything nice and aligned. I got, uh, there's a steel rod that runs through the center of it. Um, it fits uh, within a steel pipe. Um, and then there are a bunch of brass bushings, um, which have an internal diameter the same size as the outside diameter of that pipe. 
and uh, they I use those as hubs for for, for most of my gears. Um, and <clears throat> I also got some nylon washers. I use those uh, as, as spacers to reduce friction between the, the layers of plywood and keep them from rubbing against each other. Um, <clears throat> I uh, you know, I got as far about as Mars there, and uh, then I just kind of I reached the, uh, the about the limits, I think, of one, what I had to, you know, the, the resources for, and kind of two, reached the, the, the limits of the materials and design, um, you know, at, at, at a certain point, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it was going to have a whole lot of luck if I went a whole lot further than that. I kind of was hoping to get Jupiter. Um, but you know, it ended up being uh, as far as Mars. I'm pretty happy with it. The um, the, the power comes up through the center rod there, um, and it turns Mercury, um, which is the uh, the planet with the the quickest orbit. Um, and then each layer below it is a uh, gear down even further for for the next planet. There are four gears per layer. Um, and then uh, as it gets down, uh, you know. <clears throat> further and further moves uh, e e each orbit moves slower and slower um, it took a lot there were a lot of problems that I had to uh, overcome to get past this a lot of them relating to the to the nature of the material um, I one of the first big challenges I really ran into is that this uh, larger largest gear there for that is one that, that makes the moon orbit is um, it, it would, wouldn't fit on the laser cutter so I had to actually split it down the middle um, and then to glue the two parts together. I have uh, uh, two layers with the with the split staggered, and that ended up working fairly well. Um, redoing it, I would I would I would make almost all of the larger parts at least double layer. Some of those larger gears are warped, and definitely created some difficulty for me. Um, so uh, you know, I also had a problem with the motor. Um, I was powering it with a step motor, and uh, that was the plan. I had a uh, uh, motor driver that ended up not being compatible with the stepper motor, so I'm actually sharing a motor driver and controller with another project for another class, which isn't isn't really convenient, but it, it does uh, it did get the job done. And uh, I guess with that, we'll uh, watch a video of uh, the final thing. As you can see, uh, not the smoothest motion in the world. Uh, it goes back and forth a little bit. Um, one of the one of the things I realized is that the, uh, the the shaft that runs through the through the center fits in that pipe a little loosely. And while that was great for for uh, the, you know achieving low friction, which was my my initial thought, it definitely uh, especially with that stepper motor, it, it causes the whole thing to vibrate a little bit chatter a little bit. Um. So those were a couple of great projects from a mechanism, mechanisms class. And one of the challenges we, that always comes up with some of the students is CAD is such a great tool, but it's a perfect world. You know, when you build a mechanism in CAD, everything spins perfectly, all the axes, axes are, are perpendicular and parallel and everything's wonderful. The real challenge is when you start fabricating and building these complex, complex mechanisms. So those were two great examples of, of gear trains. And, and during the course of the semester, we only used a couple of gears. We did two or three gears in our gear train. And they expand that out into these really great, wonderful mechanisms. So the next course we're going to see projects from is mechatronics. And as you might guess from the, the term mechatronics, this is a, an intersection of mechanical and electrical. And it's really a great study of uh, taking the digital analog world and transferring it into motion or control. And you know, it's a very common technique on you know, machines, things like that. So if you think about automation, that is the study of mechatronics. So we, we, we venture into things like potentiometers to control mechanisms. We, we venture into resistors and LEDs. We use microprocessors to, to control these things. We, we uh, delve into programming, simple programming. We work on the, the concepts of analog and digital, which are, are very interesting. You know, with a microprocessor, you can deal with it in the analog world or the digital world. And that's a really cool concept to study. We use DC motors, servos, uh, stepper motors, 
Then we get into more complicated things like pulse width modulation, which is a concept of like a light dimmer, you know, in your house where you can reduce the, the, the voltage output by modulating these signals. And it's a great thing that comes out of the digital world of microprocessors. So here are a couple of projects from that class. Video is for ETR 140 final project, uh, introduction to mechatronics. So what we have here for our final project is a gyroscopic maze. So what do we mean by that? Well, um, this assembly here was crafted by hand out of cardboard. And we have servo motors here and here. Uh, they're wired in directly through a uh, 20 gauge wire that goes directly to a circuit playground circuit board um, as seen here. Being careful not to move anything at the moment because that will spoil the surprise. So uh, essentially what the circuit playground does, it's got a multitude of inputs and outputs, uh, but most importantly for this project, it has accelerometers. So what an accelerometer does is it senses movement on all axis, X, Y, um, even through the Z axis a little bit. So uh, the basic premise of this is that the accelerometers will sense movement. Um, and then through the magic of mu code, uh, the movement will be translated from this board through the program that runs it, through the wiring, and then through, the, through to the servo motors. Uh, the servo motors will then cause the frame to pivot this way or this way. We have an outer frame here and then an inner frame here. Uh, you'll see all the working in just a moment. So uh, without further ado, this is essentially what we have. So as this little unit here tips, so does the frame. So if we tip forward, the frame tips forward, left and right. So we have our X and Y axis. Uh, it's not limited solely to those movements, we can also tip it in any fashion that we want. The noise you hear is just a little marble rolling around. Um, it's just kind of a fun little maze to make. Uh, there is no start and stop. It's just more of a hand-eye coordination. Uh, it's a little hard to see at the moment because the angle of the camera, but uh, you get the basic idea. So there really was uh, only one challenge that I had to overcome for this. Um, through the magic of trial and error and learning, uh, what I discovered is that when servos power on, they go directly to a home position. Um, I thought I had that home position correct, which would have power on, would have had the maze in this condition here. However, when I powered it on, I did not have my home position correct, and I wound up with this. Uh, definitely not an ideal flat starting position. So I went into the MU code, and I looked for the uh, degree angle references. Um, there was a couple lines in there that rated, um, excuse me, reference zero, uh, 90, and 180 degrees. So I started adjusting those because I wasn't exactly sure where this reference was coming from. And eventually I found as I reduced the 180 degree reference uh, on each line, I would reduce it. I would get this, 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 this. Eventually it would be flat. So then I went to the second line, kept adjusting it, and eventually uh, when we have power on, we have uh, essentially virtually flat. So you can't really tell in the video here, but I am holding the circuit playground uh, in my hand here at a flat level, and the maze is flat as well. So all in all, fun little project. Uh, there are tons and tons of uses for this board. Uh, probably end up seeing this again in another class. Uh, there's like I said, many, many different inputs and outputs for this board. It's, uh, it's a neat little, neat little object here. So all in all, the project went well. Uh, a lot of creativity here. Um, this entire maze was just designed by me. <laughs> uh, just chopped up some cardboard and, and went at it. So uh, that is essentially it. It's a simple little project, but uh, it incorporated most of, the, uh, most of the things that we learned in ETR 140, such as MU code. Um, servo motors, uh, just how uh, mechanics and electronics work together. So 
Thanks for watching. Hi there. So this is my project. I uh, called it Fox Cam. Uh, utilized a old trail camera casing and added a Raspberry Pi with a camera. Um, I also attached a fan and recycled the power button off of the old trail camera. Um, pretty much it will take video, time lapse, and motion activated pictures. And I also installed software to run object recognition. So it will actually take a picture and give you labels. And I will demonstrate uh, the software running. Run script. seconds. I was also able to go into the configuration file and change a lot of the settings like turning off time lapse um, turning off video, <clears throat> naming my pictures with a designated um, file. I attempted to have it tweet the image out once it took the picture and labeled it with the labels that Google API um, software, uh, Google Cloud Vision is what I'm running and it creates the labels as you can see the picture it took if I come up here and open it up hi that's me with my phone um, generated these labels um, human finger facial hair of course <laughs> mass uh, and pretty cool software. Uh, it was a pretty cool project. I like to expand on it by adding battery, power source, and possibly a cellular modem chip and uh, a better casing and night vision um, AR, IR um, lights. So thank you for watching and uh, please tune in. This project is supposed to be an LED clock using a Arduino board for mechatronics class. The outcome, as you can see, is not as a clock, but as a vibrate, uh, vibrant board instead of lighting lights. I was unable to get to the clock, different complications between the difference of the LED strips and the coding that I was not able to fix and come up with um, the court versus what. Um, Start. Hi everyone. When I first started this project, it was going to, I was going to use a sunflower and I have two photo resistors that whichever resistor the light hits, that's the direction that the sunflower was supposed to turn. And then as I was proceeding with the project, I encountered some obstacles. One was my programming, which I would like to thank Ken for his assistance with that. And then the second was my featherboard started smoking. So I would like to thank Jason for loaning me his featherboard for this project. Um, and throughout all of this and the pandemic that we're going through, I decided to change it and try to bring some Christmas cheer to my candy cane project. Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you for the holiday chair, Miranda. Um, we're going to move on to a programming class that I taught. This is the first semester. We recently switched up a lot of our um, programs to include uh, electronic specific and a mechanical specific. And uh, this programming course uh, was developed to build on the electronics pathway to provide specific programming skills for those students. We focused mostly on um, Python 3 and we did some programming um, traditionally and then we moved on to uh, using a small educational microcontroller called the MicroBit so that we could implement MicroPython onto this board and sort of uh, build out some hardware, some software, and then combine the two together um, as part of our final projects. This board had a bunch of sensors built in, so it made it really easy uh, for us to sort of jump in and, and test out our programs. Um, so without further ado, I'll share two of the projects. One of the projects I will say was part of Hunter's class. So um, when Hunter jumps in at the end, just know that we this one project that's a little longer um, combined two of the projects together and, and you'll see that. So um, sorry, Hunter, I stole some of your thunder, um, but I'll, we'll share a couple projects. Hi everybody, my name is Sean Donahue, and this is my final project for ETR 107 programming applications for ELE and ETR calculations. And my final project, I decided to do a weather station. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to create an interface from my computer where I can make selections to go to sensors and get readings uh, about the weather as far as temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, altitude, sunlight, and wind speed. So in class, what we did was we used uh, what was called a microbit. And this is basically a pocket-sized um, computer that introduces you to how software and hardware can kind of work together. So it's got an LED um, array here. It's got two buttons. Um, it has a processor compass, accelerometer, um, and then you can do output pins here. Um, and there's also a Bluetooth capability in this, which is pretty cool. So for my weather station, I found what was called a weather bit, which was an extension of the micro bit. So this has a lot of cool stuff to it. Um, you can detect wind, how much rain, humidity, temperature, altitude, and barometric pressure. You can even do soil temperature and how much moisture is in your soil uh, if you purchase the probes for it. So this is really cool. Um, I just used it for temperature, humidity, altitude, pressure, and wind. So that's what I'm going to be using. So this plugs right into the weather bit. Like so. Show you here. And there you go. Okay, guys, I'm outside right now. It's snowing. Uh, it's beautiful out here, uh, a little cold, but I'm hoping that uh, I get some good readings with my weather station. I've got my anemometer set up here, and uh, the wind isn't really going, so hopefully it picks up a little bit later. And then um, I'll show you some readings here in a second. Thanks. Okay, so I've got my micro bit set up outside here uh, in the snow, and I want to see what the weather readings are like. So here we go. Temperature, one degree Celsius. Humidity level, 67. The light level, 255, so it's registering, it's pretty bright out. Barometric pressure, pretty low, at 1004 millibars. And we're sitting at 77 feet. So some of the issues that I had were with the wind sensor. And here's my anemometer that I made. This has a <clears throat> some cups to catch the wind. It has a reed switch. Sorry, reed switch here, which is pretty much two pieces of metal. And when a magnet comes across it, it'll they touch together, just like that. 
So I have my reed switch and then I had a magnet here. So every time that this turns around, it goes by. I don't know if you can hear that clicking, but that's the reed switch activating from the magnet. And uh, it works like a tachometer. So just the amount of pulses from the reed switch will show you miles per hour through a conversion on the micro bit. It's pretty cool. But the problem I had was getting the, um, the reed switch to work initially. And then like the first try, I tried to use the fan that it spins on to read a voltage and then convert the voltage to miles per hour. But um, the micro bit actually isn't, it, it, or the weather bit wasn't able to do that. You have to use some sort of tachometer approach to find it out. So that was a little bit of a struggle for me, but eventually. Everybody, that's it. Thanks for watching and listening and uh, enjoy this awesome weather and be safe. Hi, I'm Doug and this is my project. This is a slot car. Um, a slot car is a model car that's powered by an electric motor um, and it gets its electricity through these um, braids that are uh, at rest on the metal rails on the track. In a conventional slot car, the operator has a controller that controls the power to the, to the car, which controls the speed of the car as it goes around the track. My goal was to build a car that would do that itself, and this is how I did it. Um, in the front of the car here, you'll see this, which is an ultrasonic range sensor. It sends out ultrasonic pulses, and the time that it takes for those pulses to bounce back um, is a measure of the distance to an object in front. This ultrasonic range detector is connected to a microprocessor here on the back, which is also connected to uh, this motor control unit. So the distance information goes to the microprocessor, which translates that into a power output to the motor. Okay, so let's see how that works in practice. Uh, I have a nine volt battery here that you can see momentarily will be hooked up to the leads of the truck that send power uh, to the system. And I've got a battery there that's powering the uh, microprocessor. Okay, so let's, let's hook her up and see what happens. All right, so you can hear the motor running, and with my hand close to it, nothing's happening. If I move my hand away, hear the motor speed up. The farther away my hand gets, faster. Bring it back, slower. And you can hear the speed of the motor varying with the distance. Take my hand away, full speed. And hand up close, stop. And that's how it's supposed to work. Uh, so let's go see now what it looks like on the track. Okay, so let's see how that works live. A moment ago when you saw me bench testing it, there was no load on the motor. And unfortunately, the first time I tried this out on the track, I discovered that the load of actually driving the car would result in a current that overwhelmed the motor driver. And unfortunately, uh, it failed rather catastrophically. So for this demonstration, I cannot use full power in the system. Uh, the system typically operates at 13.5 volts and I'm gonna be operating here at around six to seven volts. Um, the other thing that's worth noting that I was very pleasantly surprised by was the fact that um, the guardrails are, are sufficient for reflecting the ultrasonic pulses. Um, when I was designing this, I, I sort of presumed I'd have to put some sort of artificial um, barrier behind the corners for the ultrasonic ranger to see, but it, I didn't need to do that. It, uh, the vertical surfaces of the rails are sufficient to reflect enough uh, ultrasonic pulses that the device can see that, which is pretty cool. So let's see what that looks like in action. Um, the power is not on right now. I'm going to go turn the power on and ramp it up slowly so we don't explode another uh, uh, motor driver. And we'll take a couple laps and you can see what that looks like.
So that's what it does, and hopefully you can see that it did accelerate in the longer stretch where there was a, a greater distance to a vertical object. Um, okay, let's take a little quick look at the code that I put together to uh, operate the truck to control the speed of the truck as a function of distance. Here you can see the uh, Arduino IDE that uh, I used to uh, put the code together. I'll point to some of the key uh, components here. Uh, this uh, configures the pins for the uh, ultrasonic sensor and output signal and an input echo. And you can see down here, this is where the uh, signal gets sent. Um, triggers the pin on high for 10 microseconds and then it goes low. It measures the duration of the pulse in in microseconds and specifies it as this variable and the duration of that echo is directly related to distance by the speed of sound um, which is where that factor comes from. Here is uh, the stuff that I put together on after a few iterations and trial and error, uh, it's a series of if statements that controls the speed of the truck as a function of distance. If the distance is less than 10 centimeters, the speed is zero, it stops. If the distance is greater than 145 centimeters to an object in front of it, it goes at full speed, 255. Um, between there, from 10 to 50 centimeters, uh, it ramps up pretty quickly. It accelerates fairly rapidly, at, uh, and I've increased the speed at a factor of four times the distance. So as the distance goes up one unit, the speed goes up four units. Um, and from 50 to 145, it increases more gradually at a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, uh, this, there's certainly room for improvement here, I'm sure, but as you saw, operating at half power uh, on the track, it was hard to tell. Um, so this is certainly sufficient for the time being. Um, what I also did down here, you can see the uh, output of the distance to the serial printer, and what that does is it outputs the, the distance from the ultrasonic ranger directly to the serial monitor here, um, and you can see that as I move the truck around, and it's looking at different things. The distance changes. If I put an object in front of it, you can see that the distance varies. Okay, let's take a quick look at the second part of this project. The second part of this project involves the use of uh, these uh, micro bits, which are small microprocessors that have a whole lot of useful built-in functionality, including what I used in this project are accelerometers and radio communications. Um, they have a built-in accelerometers that will measure the acceleration in three dimensions. And if you have two of them, as you can see, there's a micro bit mounted on the truck. Um, it is in radio communication with this micro bit that is plugged in or will be plugged into the laptop momentarily. So let me do that and show you what it looks like. And what you can see is in these graphs up here, um, let me move myself. Uh, these graphs up here show the uh, motion of the truck. And as the truck moves side to side, you can see the radial accelerometer uh, goes up and down. And as the truck moves forward and back, you can see the linear accelerometer goes positive and negative. All right, um, briefly, Here's the code that does that. This is written in micro bit make code, a really simple um, uh, tool. And this sets up the radio communications. And this says when uh, the information is received on the serial monitor, or when the information is received over the radio, it writes it to the serial monitor. Um, the code for the other micro bit that's sending it looks like this. Again, sets up the radio communications, takes the acceleration from the uh, x-axis and reports it as radial, takes the acceleration from the z-axis and reports it as linear. And that gives you this cool um, plot. All right. Well, that's my project. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, I know I did. I know I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about the hardware software interface um, and how applications are designed to control operations, particularly motor functions. Um, that was really interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit over this. Uh, the next class is IND 250. It was a CNC machining course, and um, this was a uh, cassette uh, and sprocket from a bike that a student created. And um, we got to use CNC routers, CAD CAM software, we use SOLIDWORKS with HSM. 
and we got to use CNC milling machines. This class was particularly difficult to get lab time, but um, a lot of students persevered and got to make some really cool parts for the final project where they uh, had to make two parts that fit together or uh, created an assembly. So they designed them and then created all of the CAM and G code for the machine that they were using. Hello everyone. My name is Andrew Breeden, and for my project, I made a lead sinker mold out of 7075 aluminum. The original idea for my project was to make a tiny mold out of steel to produce one sinker at a time, but after doing some research on the melting point of lead and aluminum, I determined that aluminum would be a suitable material for the mold. Going with aluminum allowed me to significantly increase the scope of the project, so I decided to make a mold that would produce six sinkers in total two half ounce, two one ounce, and two two ounce sinkers. I started out by opening up SolidWorks and sketching what I imagined a regular fishing sinker would look like. Using the SolidWorks design skills that I have obtained over the last two semesters of this class, I was able to make a parameterized sinker model with nice radii on it that make the resulting mold manufacturable. Using the mass properties feature in SOLIDWORKS, I told the software that my part was pure lead and adjusted the dimensions of the base sketch until the modeled sinker was roughly one ounce or 0 0.065 pounds. Then I saved the part, copied it twice, and edited the copied files to make a half ounce sinker and a two ounce one. Once I had three models, I imported them into an assembly file, duplicated them and mated them up in a straight line with the tops aligned and with a space between each of them. I then created font blocks at the top of each pair of sinkers for the molten lead to be poured. Once I had the assembly created, I then made a rectangular box around the whole assembly and extruded a block on each side. This would make up the two halves of the mold. I used the cavity feature in SOLIDWORKS to subtract the solid bodies in the assembly from the mold halves that I had just created and this left me with two models to help create the final product. Once I had the models, I imported them into CAM and got to work setting up the machining for the part. I first cut out two pieces of stock on a horizontal bandsaw, measured the stock that I cut and created stock models that resembled the cut pieces used for the CAM. That's what you see here. I then had to come up with an array of tools to produce the part, so here's what I came up with. A three inch shell mill with six indexable PCD inserts to face the top of the part. A three eighths inch, one inch length to cut. Three flute coated carbide end mill to contour the outside of the part. A quarter inch, seven eighths length to cut. Three flute coated carbide end mill to rough out the part. A three millimeter by 10 millimeter length to cut carbide end mill with three flutes to rough out the part further, a one millimeter carbide tapered ball end mill to rough out the part to five thousandths remaining stock, and then a two millimeter, eight millimeter length of cut carbide two flute ball end mill to do the semi finish and uh, finish with. And then I also set up a drill chuck with a D drill, uh, 249 and a half thousandths reamer to press fit quarter inch dowels in one half and a 251 thousandths reamer to slip fit the dowels in the other half. I put all those tools in the machine and measured them. So now I had my stock cut and my tool list. So I sat down and programmed the cam. I simulated the stock removal process and took screenshots of each stage in the progression so you can see how the machining process was done for each half. The parts are mirror images of each other so I only took screenshots of one half for better image quality, but you can assume the exact same process is being applied to the other half in the second vise. The first one is the block with the top faced. That's what you see here. The second and third images show the outside dimensions cut to size with the 3 eighths end mill. The fourth shows the part um, roughed out with a quarter inch end mill. The fifth is roughing with a three millimeter Roughing with the one millimeter tapered ball down to 5,000 stock remaining. Drill to ream dowel pin holes. And then a profile and semi finish, or profile, semi finish, and finish 
with a two millimeter ball end mill. Now that I had the CAM program and everything checked out with the machining simulation, I put two vices on the machine, indicated the menstruate, and probed the top of the jaw. Using the Mighty Bite jaws, I clamped my parts into the vices with one piece in the left vise and one in the right. I probed the part on the left and called that offset G54, probed the part on the right and called that G55. I then ran my program from start to finish, which took roughly 10 hours of machining time. And here's my final product. I was very pleased with the surface finish of my part. And the only thing that I would change about the design is if I did it again in the future, I would put a hinge and a handle on one side of, or a hinge on one side and a handle on the other to make it easier to open and close the mold. I do machine work for a living. So physically making the mold wasn't much of a problem for me, but it was great practice. The main takeaway from this class on my final project is that I have made huge improvements in SOLIDWORKS CAD and really begun to appreciate the power of the history-based solid modeling. At first I hated it because it's really easy to get hung up on rebuilding issues. If you change or delete something by accident that has ties to some other part of the design, that's where most of my struggles with this project arose. I just had to keep going back and starting over until I finally figured out what I was doing wrong. Over the course of this project, I have learned that although it can be complicated, it's a very powerful tool to be able to make a sketch, design a part, design a mold around that part, and then go back and adjust the original sketch and have the mold change accordingly. It's awesome. Anyways, that was my final project. Thanks for taking the time to watch and listen. Have a wonderful evening. Hello, my name is Matt Lewis, and this is my final project for IND 250, uh, fall of 2020. Uh, so this is my part uh, in the CAD software. So it's a relatively simple part. It basically has um, two slots, um, this, this slot on top, and then a slot on the bottom, which is perpendicular to it with this little extrusion. Um, so what this part is for is that uh, you put this top slot is, is for a bubble level, and then this bottom slot is to mount on top of a Picatinny rail. Uh, so this this would be used for mounting a, a rifle scope of keeping everything nice and level, um, which is can be a pretty big great, big deal in shooting uh, longer range. Um, so nothing nothing too complicated. Um, I think it's only about two inches long, about about half an inch and about an inch less than an inch tall. Um, so this is designed for it. Next, we'll go into some of the videos of milling it out on the uh, Tormach. It's kind of hard to see, but here's the here's the block. Start off about uh, two inches, two and a half inches by two and a half inches by an inch tall. And right now, uh, this video is doing the adaptive cut of doing the uh, uh, the, the top section of uh, the first half. So this video is still on the top, the first half, and right now it's milling the, the internal part of that slot. So it's working its way through the middle. Then the third video is the is the finished product. Uh, for the uh, halfway through, we had to flip the part and mill out the, the second slot. Uh, which follow the same um, same guidelines. It was a little bit more difficult just because of that extrusion, but but uh, Eric and I were mostly Eric, of course, were we were able to figure out how to get the cam uh, set up for the for the right tool, tool pass. Uh, and then this is the finished result. So here's the bubble level sitting in in that top slot. And then that bottom slot is perpendicular and it lines up with this Picatinny rail. The extrusion lines up just in, in one of these slots on the Picatinny rail, and that way it keeps the, the bubble level uh, nice and nice and perpendicular. You see lining up there, and it keeps it uh, flat with the top of that rail to keep everything nice and in, in line. Uh, so it's a really fun project. Um, learned a lot. Um, learned a lot. So my the tolerances I had on the inside of the slots were a little tight. I think I only had one thousandth. 
uh, of an inch, and so that was way too tight, but it wasn't a big deal. I just used the file and some sandpaper and sand everything down until it fit. Um, I struggle with doing some of the, the tool paths in CAM, especially on the bottom. Um, this is kind of more of a complicated um, complicated feature to, to set up for the Tormach, um, and eventually Eric was able to figure it out. Um, we had a couple of solutions, but they were going to take way too long. Uh, so definitely, definitely struggle with that, uh, but in the end we were, we were able to figure it out. Um, as far as improvements, it part performs just, just how we needed to. Uh, like I said, the tolerances were a little tight, but besides that, uh, it works great. I'll probably finish it with some rubberized coating, that way it doesn't scratch different surfaces, but it, it works great. And so, that, yep, this is my final project, and really enjoyed IND250, and look forward to taking IND251 in the spring. Thanks. Awesome. Great stuff. Uh, that was a fun class, and I'm glad that we all got a little bit of time to do uh, some machining. Uh, I'm going to move on to Hunter. Uh, Hunter taught ETR 237 Industrial Electronics. Take it away. Hello. Uh, so, like Eric said, my name is Hunter Long. Uh, I would I would start my video, but it uh, I apparently can't start it right now. Um, yeah. So this was my first semester uh, teaching a class, and it was like Eric said, uh, kind of a difficult semester to get started. Everything is even more unusual than normal. Um, but it was a really great experience. And uh, the class that I taught was ETR uh, 237 and um, it's industrial industrial electronics. Um, so in the class, we used a microcontroller board called the uh, Adafruit Feather. And we also um, used a, um, uh, motor driver board that you saw in, in Doug's slot car video, uh, that motor driver board, we experimented with um, servo motors and stepper motors and DC motors and just how to drive them, um, as well as a couple of different uh, programming tasks that we worked on with the class. And uh, I, was, I was really blown away with just the projects and the uh, things the students were able to do with, you know, just a small starting point of some basic motor driving code and moving on to some really cool projects that they kind of ran with. So that, that was really neat to see. Um, I think Eric is gonna show. Hello, me. this is Coleman Packard uh, doing the video for my final projects for the semester for ETR 237 with Hunter Long and IND 250 with Eric Brother. I attempted to make a dual dial clock uh, with limited success on the coding side. Everything else seems to be all right. Uh, as far as the IND 250 section of the project, which was a computer aided manufacturing course, I made this box, uh, this stand, this dial stand in uh, Autodesk Inventor and used uh, Inventor Cam as the milling software side of things uh, built off of HSM Ultimate. And so what I have here is, uh, is a five piece dual dial holder and stand that I made out of one single piece of half inch uh, plywood stock. I in CAD did these dials, did these uh, pockets, did the pockets for the stepper motors to hold in and cut out these four base stands. One thing that I didn't plan on initially um, with the design was I made these pockets for the cutouts for the stand and these stand Pieces. I made them the exact same size, and that created a situation where I was hoping to go for a friction fit, but it was a little bit too tight, 
And even after doing the milling work, I had to do uh, hit it with the bandsaw to clean it up. And then another issue was, as you can see where the wires are sticking out, uh, I had to cut off these ends here to make sure I had enough clearance to, to get my wires to come out. And so just to, to keep this going, this is my CAD design. I started, uh, if you can kind of see those blue lines on the side, I started with a, a solid piece of stock and then I did my design out of it and cut, ended up uh, extrude cuts all the way through the, to get that to look right. It's um, subtractive manufacturing, so I thought it, it might just be better. There's a better view of the stock itself, and I'll go through my tool paths real quick. Um, I did a pocket to, to etch out my, my dial markers, and that got that um, taken care of. And then went down, did an adaptive clearing for this initial pocket because it was a little bit faster. And since I wasn't cutting away that much at any one time, it, it worked out a little bit better. Then I did a pocket uh, with multiple depths to, to take out that middle section. And also a thing that I realized is, and the ones that the software would take was always just going in that direction. So that's kind of what I ended up with there wired it up together. There's my my feather board and my, my motor driver board. Uh, motor driver board's on top, stacked in. One thing that I realized when I was and worried about when I was coding all this, um, the stepper motors get very hot off this five volt power supply. And moving over here, this is what I was able to figure out for the code. Not as much. Had problems, again, trying to make sure that, trying to get it to spin the right way, trying to get both these to spin in the same direction. What I wanted to do was to have it be a clock or a timer where this dial would, would do hours, this dial would do minutes, and then ideally, if, if I'd been able to figure it out, be able to hit a switch, and then this would switch from hours to minutes, so then count minutes, and then this would go from minutes to seconds. And so that way you, you could time however you felt like timing on a smaller scale. And um, to, to help me figure out what was going on with, with my CAD or my, my code, I used, um, I was able to wire it up using this schematic only for, to make sure I got the wires correct off of the stepper motors. And so that helped. That's just a uh, pin out of the, the Blue Fruit uh, feather board. And then this page with the motor driver information and a bunch of other resources to try and figure out the code. It didn't happen, unfortunately. Connections. This is oh, just the backside showing where the temperature sensor connections go there. This is um, my wiring diagram I used. I just stuck this on top because I used the stacking headers to connect the feather wing to the M0. So um, that's kind of how I pictured that there. Um, and then I used pin A0 for the output voltage from the sensor. Um, of course, ground and then... You could either use 3 volts or 5 volts, depending on how you set up your code, the math in it. Um, I just went with 3 volts just because all the pins were right there. The 5 volts is on this side, so it just makes it look cleaner. And then this will be my 9-volt battery going to the motor driver, and then the fan connected to motor 1. Um, this is the piece or screenshot of the code where if it's... In this case, it was set so if it's under 20 degrees Celsius, the motor speed would be zero or off. Um, this is the main part where it says if it's less, if it's bigger than 20 or less than 30 in this case. Um, so 30 would be the max speed, 20 would be the minimum. So it would range in a linear curve from zero to 255 in between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius. The particular one I had it set to where, um, you know, if it's 
in between 20 and 60. That's where it would ramp. Oh, to joy. Just barely got it. <laughs> what we've got currently, um, this is me feeding a signal into it with a uh, with a, a uh, function generator. I'm feeding a offset sine wave into the microcontroller, and it's recognizing uh, that it's getting some frequency, although it should be. All right. So this is my robot here. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty prehistoric, but it works. So this is the brain right here. This is where I upload the code through this port and then it runs it with these serial connections over to the motor stepper board. And the motor stepper board gets its power from these cords right here running down to a battery pack that I have taped just with four AA batteries. And these two motors are running over to these two ports right here. And so these are connected to ground and then this chip is running on a uh, just lithium ion battery. And so yeah, when I plug this battery in, the wheels will start turning forward for, I believe, five seconds and then back for five seconds. And then this is just a little, a little leg to keep it balanced, nothing fancy. So yeah. So our uh, final projects tonight are from the uh, ELE-239 class, which is Programmable Controllers. And that is a fancy way to say industrial computers. And industrial computers are uh, very common out in industry, especially in manufacturing. They are incredibly stable and they're great at controlling large machinery. So it's, uh, it's kind of like the microprocessors you've seen tonight, but on an industrial scale. And instead of $20, they cost several thousand dollars. So early in my career as a mechanical engineer, we used to, I used to design machines that use these. So it's a, it's a fun class for me to teach. So these, these computers are called programmable logic controllers and logic is the key word in this. So we use logic-based programming. So some of the code you've seen tonight is uh, traditional programming code that you would think about. In PLCs, they use what's called ladder logic. So it's a very easy programming to understand because it's, it's like, uh, the, 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 they call it ladder logic because the, the programming actually looks like a ladder. So you can imagine you've got two vertical rails and then your rungs going down. So the rungs are actually uh, rows of logic. So you can use sensors or, or whatever kind of inputs you want. So you can, you know, on the left, you can say, if this sensor turns on, on the right, you'll have some output and they call it a coil. So the students learn how to use this logic to do various things. And, you know, we start out with, uh, basic programming and turn on LEDs and things like that. Uh, because it's an industrial based computer, it, it's very complicated and uh, it gets interesting and we get into interesting challenges because it is capable of doing so many things. We uh, end up kind of in a, a, a state where we create uh, logic for things like, we, we have a, a variety of projects we worked on during the class. We did conveyor systems, we did, uh, what else did we do? We did some uh, uh, a garage door opener. So 
they were uh, pretty pretty cool projects, and I, I think you'll enjoy what the what the students worked on. Hello, here is my mixer project. As you can see, I have a two this is not one of them. switches and four motors. This is from here. Here's my low limit switch and high limit switch. Here's my low limit motor, high limit motor, mixer motor, and drainage motor. In this, uh, I'm trying to mix two liquids and from uh, low limit motor and from high limit motor. So once my low limit motor start and it start filling the tank, so once it reach to the low limit switch, my low limit motor will stop. And after that, my low, low limit motor stop, then my high, high limit motor will start. And it start filling my tank until it reach to the high limit switch. So once it reach to high limit switch, then my high limit motor will stop. So after my high limit motor stop, then my mixer motor will start. It will run for whatever the time I gave to run, just say for like 10 seconds. So then after 10 seconds, my mixer motor will stop and the drainage motor will start. And it will drain the liquid until it reach below the low limit switch. And, and after low limit switch, then my low limit motor will start again. And it will keep uh, running this process until I press the stop. And here's my ladder logic. As you can see, this is my stop push button, and this is my start push button. And in this rung, I'm creating a, just a latch bit. So this is my latch bit. With this latch bit, I'm turning on my low limit motor. So once it reached to my low limit switch, then my low limit motor will stop. Then my high limit motor will start from here. So once my high limit motor uh, reach to the high limit switch then my high limit motor will stop then it will go to the timer and the timer will start my mixer motor so while the timer is timing my mixer motor is running and after the time is finished then my done bit will be turned on the drain motor and the drain motor will run until it go below limit switch uh, low limit switch then it will repeat this process again here is the hardware and the PLC for my mixer project. And as you can see, this one has a start switch and low limit motor with indicator LED. This motor will stop, then my high limit motor will start. Matt Lewis. This is my final project for ELE 239 programmable controllers. Uh, so for, for my final project, I decided to try to automate a reloading press. And this is just a simulation. I actually do this in person. Um, but so I have a reloading press similar to what you see 
um, right here. So basically it's progressive as in there are four stages and as you pull this lever and rotate this base plate, you, um, a case begins and is gradually completed uh, for reloading ammunition. You usually start with um, a case that's been shot before and components are gradually added until it's completed. Components are added and then a process is completed, usually with this lever. So you put in a case, uh, you pull the lever, it inserts a primer, resizes the case, you rotate, insert another case, and as it goes around, you add more and more. But so second stage, um, powder is added once the lever has is, uh, been pulled. Um, third stage, you add a bullet, pull the lever, it's, it uh, inserts the bullet, seats the bullet. Um, fourth stage, it then crimps the case back onto the bullet to make sure it holds it. Uh, and then that, com that completes a round. So as you pull this lever, it completes all those stages simultaneously. Um, so the need to automate comes up is that, you know, it's, it's kind of a tedious, um, tedious process and there are a lot of steps that you have to do manually in, a, in a, the exact order, or you could um, cause a, an issue and error. Um, so that's the idea, this video is a similar reloading press, um, and this is a commercial option, but this shows um, basically the goal of the project. Same, same concept. Um, so for my project, I wrote Lad Logic to accomplish this. Uh, there are 13 sensors and then four outputs, so basically 13 sensors and four, four motors. Um, some of the sensors to pick up on if any of the reloading supplies become empty, then the the you know, reloading press will, will stop. Um, but this is all the, the logic to accomplish that. Uh, so pretty significant, actually turned out to be uh, much more complicated uh, than I originally anticipated, but um, I was able to get it working and it was a great learning experience. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much about it. Unfortunately, I didn't get to develop any visual visualizations because I um, spent a lot of time getting the, the logic to work. Um, but learned a lot, incorporated some new things like uh, rising edge triggers, some things we learned. Um, but yeah, um, that's about it. Awesome. Uh, I just want to say thank you all so much for coming. We're a few minutes past our time. But uh, we just want to uh, wish everyone a safe uh, holiday break and um, to enjoy some time off with your family, friends, uh, maybe virtually, and uh, hopefully you can, can relax a little bit. Um, thank you all again. Stay safe and uh, have a great one. We'll post some of these videos as well for other projects, um, like some guitars some students made, some more robots. Um, some very colorful gears and, and, and all kinds of great stuff. So um, check, check in with some other great stuff. And uh, to answer Bob's question, there, there was a few. There was some automated, um, uh, Dustin made an automated uh, dispenser uh, for hand sanitizer so you didn't have to touch the hand sanitizer uh, for like a pump style. Uh, so that was kind of cool. We had an um, automated trash can as well. Ah, automated trash can. Yes, yes. Yeah, so there were there were some that just uh, unfortunately didn't either get to video production or didn't make the didn't make the cut uh, right now. But um, we'll, we'll share as much as we can as students take the last couple, um, you know, days to finish a few things up. So thank you all so much. If you have questions, we'll hang out for a little bit. Um, and then we'll post this recording as well. And if you're interested uh, at looking at some of the other student projects, I've posted them on Instagram at ebretter, um, and I try to keep updated as we're working. So anyways, thank you all so much. Have a good one. See you guys soon.